Okay. Any questions? Are we lacking some students here? Maybe? Here, maybe? Okay. They will come. Okay. Now let's move to this other alternative where uh, again the point is to push prices up but in this case uh, the kind of extra cost on the producer hand is uh, taken by the government. So what's happening here is that the government they decide uh, two things. They decide both that they want to have a higher price but in order to reach that price and to get the correct quantity they kind of um, buy from the market. The no normal way of doing this is of course that um, for instance like we do in Norwegian uh, pork farming you know these farmers they produce this uh, pig meat pork and um, and uh, in order to keep these farmers alive, they, they kind of need to have a, quant a bigger quantity than the Norwegian consumers would like. So in order to achieve, achieve that, the government decides that they will buy a certain amount of pigs to kind of reach the right price level to keep Norwegian pig farmers alive. Of course, the government then is left with a lot of pigs, aren't they? That is uh, what will happen. And, uh, what they typically do then is that they export this pig meat at a much lower price than the price which are put in the Norwegian market. Kind of a tricky, tricky strategy, but uh, almost the only way of doing that. But uh, of course what's happening here is that um, effectively what this means is that the government, they kind of have to push the demand curve up to a new level so that the actual equilibrium now is at this point producing that PS price and then getting these manufactured so the pig farmers they keep on producing more pigs now to to, uh, to reach this level and this amount here which they kind of have to put in extra which to, to kind of move this demand curve up here is given by this distance here and of course the cost for the government then can be calculated as this whole area here. They have to buy all these pigs at the price of PS and they have to buy this amount to get the demand curve out here. This difference between Q2 and Q1. So in this case, the, uh, should we say the inefficiency loss is even bigger. If you remember from the previous figure, it was kind of related to this part plus this part, now you also get this part in as well. Okay. We call back here. Here you kind of get, unfortunately, we don't see the color here. Okay. These parts are losses in a sense. Some are positive, some are negative, and this part is loss. But this part is kind of also added now due to the fact that you actually have to push up the, the, the mount curve. So, so this is a kind of strategy which you actually see a lot, okay, but it's kind of um, extremely inefficient. And some uh, Norwegian consumers may find it very un nice that uh, the pig meat which is produced in Norway, bought here, costs 100 kroners per kilo, but if you go down to Germany and find Norwegian pig, it's only 10 kroners per kilo. Okay, that's typically what, what happens. We kind of push the prices up internally to, to cross-subsidize the Norwegian farmers. Again, uh, some economists say it's much better to pay these pig, pig farmers for doing nothing. Okay, that's much less inefficient. And of course, from an eco economic point of view, that's, the, that's true, actually. It's much less inefficient to, 
to do that. And it's very easy to construct examples where you, you can see that immediately. Of course, paying people for doing nothing has some moral consequences, doesn't it? As long as they keep their time producing pigs, then they can't do any other harms. Okay? If you pay them for doing nothing, then they can start doing a lot of problematic things. Okay? They can be lazy, they can start abusing their children or wives or whatever. Okay? So, uh, there is some reasons, apart from this kind of big calculation, why you really don't like to, to give people money for doing nothing. Although we have those systems in Norway as well, don't we? This kontantstøtte, kind of a cash given to parents, so they can kind of choose either to not have it, putting the children in the kindergarten or staying at home with the children. Again, of course, you pay people for doing nothing. Okay. Yeah. A little bit on import quotas and tariffs. Okay, many countries use import quotas or tariffs to keep national prices above world market equilibrium. Again, much of the same reasoning, typically related to farming. Uh, producing food in Norway is expensive due to the climate and the geog geographical structures, as you probably have seen by watching this country, just like Iceland. It's very hard to uh, grow wheat in Iceland. It's probably not possible at all. Doing it? Uh, Where do they do that? The southern. southern parts? So is it possible then? It's not very effi effective, is it? I think it's not the same. It's not the same wheat. It's a different type yeah, of wheat. It's, it's, it's a different kind, but yeah. Is it cold wheat? You know this corn you put in light, light bread? Yeah, I just need to. So it's talk about the same thing. As you probably know, this wheat produced in Norway is not, is not good enough to use for human feed. So we have to import all the wheat. Although we produce some wheat here, it's only f fed back into <coughs> the animals, basically. So obviously, there are certain situations in certain countries where you kind of would like to have a certain price locally, which is much higher than, again, than the world market price. Because the world market price would not tempt any Norwegian farmers to produce wheat. The world market price is so far below. <coughs> you see the same in other agricultural products like cheese, for instance, where you have uh, put a lot of tariffs on, on it. <coughs> so the reason is kind of obvious here. There is some competitional disadvantages related to various geographical locations, related to different <coughs> types of markets, and to kind of keep some production locally, you kind of need to do this. If you don't, then the local production vanishes. Of course, somebody asks, what's the problem with that? Of course, it's a problem for those who like to have local produ production, but there are some other arguments as well, of course. If you I don't know if anybody of you have been in Sweden. Well, if you take the train in Sweden from Stockholm to, let's say, Sundsvall, there is nothing. From Stockholm to Sundsvall, there is nothing left. In the old days, there was a lot of small cities, and people lived there, they were farmers and so on, but today there is nothing. In Norway, on the other hand, if you take the train from, uh, from uh, let's say, Trondheim to maybe even up to Tromsø, no, you can't actually take the train to Tromsø, can you? Suppose you, you settle for Bode then, which, which has actually has a railway. <laughs> then, then there is a lot there, okay? So in Norway, we have chosen different policies. We have chosen to kind of subsidize local farmers, <coughs> to kind of keep things running. The alternative is that everybody moves to the big cities, okay? So in Norway, we have, have a kind of a, a spread population while in Sweden, our neighboring country, they've done the opposite. Of course, there is a, a very good reason for this, then that the Swedes, they don't have the oil, oil money as we have. Okay, so we, have a kind of we can afford this, doing this. But the Swedes, they couldn't afford it. So it's, it's kind of uh, sad in a sense, but uh, that's just how modern economic forces kind of work. What's the things in the States, Eric, these days? You're from Michigan, aren't you? That's not very heavily populated. How many people are living in Michigan? Nine million. Nine million, okay, but it's still a very large area, isn't it? So it's, it's there's kind of vast areas, I would assume, yeah. But in the old days, there were farming activities everywhere. Is it kind of going down or is it keeping steady? It's going down. 
it's going down. So what are the big cities in Michigan? Uh, Detroit. Detroit, yeah. But Detroit is going down as well, isn't it? The car manufacturing is not good. So uh, people in det Detroit are moving elsewhere then, I assume. Where is it? Down south or east or west or in all the right directions. Okay. So uh, there are two kind of means to do this, either to use import quotas, which kind of denies keeping it out, basically means that you put a tariff which is infinite on it, or alternatively kind of open up opening up for imports, but then you kind of add to the world market price to, to keep it at a, a level according to the, the level you, you like. So import, import quotas restrict restricts imported quantities, while tariffs puts prices on imported quantities. We refer to these as toll in Norwegian, okay? You know what toll is, those of you who are Norwegians? Yeah. So uh, let's look uh, a little bit on these effects here. Here is analyzing an import quota, okay? I think you don't look on the right side, look at the left side here. In the free market, the domestic price equals the world price PW. So here is the PW price, okay? This is the world market price. Of course, this is a given product. So the actual price in the country will have to be the world market price, unless you do something, okay? Now, these are the local suppliers here. These are the local demanders in this country, which may be Norway. And this is the world market price. Of course, <coughs> for that price, the local suppliers will only supply this amount here. Q, what does it say? Can you read that? S? Ah, it's S, yes, it seems. Maybe it's S. Let's see. Mm, this is at least QD, okay? Domestic. Okay, in any case, this is kind of what the local market puts into it, okay? But that when the, the price is down here, of course, there will be some imports here. So we're going to end up up here, because this is the actual demand at that price level. So a certain part is kind of distributed into the economy locally, and this part is put by, uh, is uh, served by imports. Imports, as it says here. The rest imported. When imports are eliminated, the government says, no, we forbid the imports. It's not allowed to forbid to, to import this wheat from USA or s Russia or wherever they actually produce it. Then, of course, something happens. Then you kind of close the economy, and of course, you then are put into the normal general equilibrium situation in this country. So, this is kind of the opposite of what we have done so far. Okay, when we move from a, a situation of uh, of supply not equal to demand into the, the kind of old uh, old equilibrium. Of course, then the price increases up to P0. And there is a certain gain, though, of course. It says here that the gain to producers is trapeze with A. Of course, the producers, they will now suddenly sell from this up and this, so they get an extra gain due to the, uh, compared to this price related to by this trapezium A here, because they are able to sell at a higher price than they did previously. So the producers are happy here. The loss to consumers is of course worse, because the consumers here, they will have to pay a higher price, so they lose this same trapezium, but they also lose these dead weight loss parts of B and C, as can be seen here. So of course, the again, the dead weight loss, which kind of is the total sum for both groups, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's A plus B plus C to the consumers with negative, and, and then it's the op opposite sign of the A minus A plus B plus C. So if you take the, the, the uh, and subtract these two, you end up with B. You see, these A's are canceling each other. One is positive for the producers, they get a higher price, which is again negative for the consumers. So that is cancelled, and you're kind of left with with these as, again, uh, a dead weight loss here. Okay. Now let's look at a tax per unit sold, or at a tariff, as it's often called, or toll innovation. Then you, you do not, in, t in the previous case, we kind of forbid the import. In this case, you allow import, but you put an extra price on top of each unit sold of the product. 
And in this case, you have a certain equilibrium situation. You have a demand curve and a supply curve. And then, of course, the government here decides on how much they should put on top of the given price of the product. <laughs> and in this case, this distance t here is the tax okay, per unit. Uh, the interesting thing with, with this, this kind of taxation is, of course, that it, even though it leads to an increased price on the consumer hand, it also has effects on, on the producer hand. Let's look what it says here. PB is the price, including the tax, paid by the buyers. Okay? So this, uh, this, uh, this price here is kind of what you have to pay for the product. PS is the price that the sellers receive, or the producers here. Okay? So they will produce this Q1 quantity, given that price. And of course, the government kind of they takes in this tax. It's given to a third part here. So what about the buyers here? Okay, the buyers, they would like to be in this price situation. So the consumers, they pay too much, too high a price. So they will lose this first, they will lose this area A. And of course, again, there are certain consumers here who don't consume due to the fact that the price is not here, not here, but here, so it's moved down here. So this is also a loss to the consumers. So the consumers, they lose A plus B. Similarly, the sellers, they lose the same kind of structure, don't they? Because they get too low a price below the P0, so they lose this D. And again, another day dead weight loss on the C hand on the producer side. So the consumers lose and the producers lose. That, that should not come as a big surprise. Of course, the winner here is the state who kind of takes this area in as, uh, as, uh, as direct income. Okay? This is produced per unit, they get this tax, so this times this produces the income to the government, or A plus D as it says here. The interesting thing about this taxation is that it kind of behaves slightly differently depending on the shapes of the demand and the supply curves. So if you look at the next figure here, you will see that if you have <coughs> a very steep demand curve and not so steep supply curve, you get a kind of division between producers and suppliers which are kind of uneven. In the previous case here you see producers and consumers kind of lose the same here. This area is the same as this area. Okay, So they, they evenly distribute the uh, burden of the tax, so to speak. But if it's like on the left here, you see that this part now, which is the loss of the consumers, are much bigger than this part, which is the loss of the producers. So the producers will be much more happy if you have a very steep demand curve. The opposite situation, where we have a very steep supply curve, pr turns out to be the ex exact opposite, because in this case, the consumers only lose this little part, while this big part is lost by the producers. So depending on the shape of the demand and or the supply curve, these bird no taxes can be distributed different between these two groups. And again, if you think about democracy, there are normally more consumers than producers. It seems obvious that situations which kind of looks like these are easier to vote through than situations who looks like this. Because this is less of a burden for the consumers as opposed to the producers. Okay, that was all actually. Do you have any questions? The idea with this chapter is, as I said previously, to try to look at consequences of doing things with the economy. Of course, this is done at a very simplified level. If you really want to analyze this, you really have to do it uh, with much in much more detail than we actually do here. But uh, the idea here is to give you some indications on what happens 
if you start making changes in, a, in, 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 in the economy. And in general, the answer to all this is very simple. Unless there are externalities or other types of market failures, it's really not a good idea from an efficient efficiency point of view to start making changes in equilibrium situations. You should, uh, in principle, have very good arguments for doing that. There is, of course, a classic argument, and the classic argument is that a government or a public sector needs money to run. Okay, you need military services, you need schools, you need hospitals, and so on. And to pay for this, or actually to give those who work there uh, their wages, you need to have money. The normal way of doing that is to get those people who kind of produce in the market to pay for it. And we normally do that by taxes. Okay, so tax the taxation system is, um, is uh, an important argument for making interventions in economic systems. The other important argument, and of course, given that you want to do that, it's perhaps a good idea to, to try to do it in such a way that you don't make it too inefficient. So many important political decisions made in most countries are related to kind of picking through a menu, for instance, for raising taxes. If you want to have more taxes, then you can do it like this or like that and so on. There are different ways of doing it. And you, you start very often by doing this these type of analysis to kind of pick the one which has the least inefficiency effects. Uh, of course, we know something in general here. If you, for instance, uh, a classical uh, solution from uh, public economy is that uh, if you want to put taxation on people directly, or income tax as we, we normally call it, these of course are not income tax. This is what we in, in Norway call avgifte or or money put on the product directly. But if you taxate people directly through their income, it's, it turns out that uh, the only tax system that doesn't work bad is uh, uh, a so-called wage-independent tax, meaning that everybody should pay the same in taxes. Because if you introduce a taxation system that depends on how much money people earn, then you implicitly introduce a taxation system which is linked to how much they work. And if this taxation system doesn't work exactly as it should, it could lead to a situation where people choose to work different amount of hours than they would have done without the taxation system. And that is a dis di disturbance in the economy. That leads to inefficiency. I would like to work 10 hours a week, but the system here only allows me to work 8 hours a week. Okay, That's not good. If I liked, if would like to do that, it would be more efficient for society if I were allowed to do that. But as the situation is, I'm not. At least not in general. Okay? I can work more than eight hours a week for a certain amount of times, but not a very long time. We have certain regulations in Norway called Arbeis Minilov that kind of forbids people to work as much as they like. And this is from an economic point of view, not a good good thing to do. On the other hand, there are other arguments for doing this, isn't it? You want to avoid that people are exploited. You kind of have no option than have to follow kind of their leader's commandment on how much to work. And of course, in many older, older days, we saw situations where people were working both 10 and 12 and 14 and 16 and 20 hours a day. Of course, there is certain limits here that that should be given. So this kind of material kind of points out the eternal conflict between politics, morals, ethics, and economic theory. Economic theory do not guarantee justness. Okay? It uh, only guarantees efficiency or non-efficiency. In general, unfortunately, it's such that what is most efficient is perhaps most unjust. So this is a kind of an, an eternal conflict. Today, in most societies, we see always see a kind of a mix here, where you kind of, to, uh, to some extent, you try to look at efficiency, trying to doing things that are most efficient. On the other hand, you kind of know that it's not efficient. But be aware of the fact that all our arguments we have made so far are based on one important assumption. And that assumption is that the models we look at are perfectly competitive. 
And as we have said already, most markets are not perfectly competitive. So one important question to ask then was would these same kind of arguments apply if the mar markets are not perfectly competitive? To some extent in monopoly markets, as we will see in the next chapter, they do, they do hold. But apart from that, we are kind of... Uh, uh, the knowledge is not very good, so to speak. Uh, what we have found out about these kind of markets is more or less, at the moment, not at these sophistication levels. So the eff effect of kind of regulating non-perfect competitive markets are, um, are uh, not very well researched, so to speak. So there is still a long way to go there before we, we get gain the understanding of how it works. Of course, in general, you would expect similar situations that if you start tampering with the economy, making people change their decisions into what is non-optimal from the consumer and or the producer's side, then that would lead to inefficiency, inefficiency even in, in those situations. Some economists will argue that it leads to more inefficiency. Some would ask, argue the other way. It depends a lot on the assumptions here. Th then you start getting into more complex matters and, and some more specific assumptions must be made in order to be able to say something in general. In these cases, we are kind of able to say state things very generally, but the problem, as I said, is that the models we kind of use here, they are perhaps not representative for, for the real world, at least not in most situations. Okay, any questions? Is this clear? A pig, yeah, you know what a pig is? Yeah. Yeah, and it's an animal. And then how can they increase the demand? How can they increase the demand? Eh, of course, they are a part of them. The, there are there are Norwegians, they are a part of the demanders, they buy pigs, but the government also buy pigs. So they kind of increase the number of people demanding it. Okay. That's what, it. what does the government do with the pigs? They sell it. They sell it to you in and to, to those. Price? And to not in Norway, of course. You can't sell it in Norway. I mean, in the lower price? Or yeah. Yeah, that's how they dump the, the pig meat. They sell it in Denmark for one tenth of what they sell it here. The alternative would be to burn it. Okay. Yeah. Or if you can, you maybe you shouldn't burn it. You can just roast it. Okay. <laughs> there are not enough people to eat it in Norway. The same with butter. You know, the European Union they had this kind of mountain of butter at some point, and they overproduced butter enormously. Because there was a lot of farmers in, in Europe who produced milk and, you know, there is a certain limited amount of milk you can sell fresh. Other parts of it you have to use to cheese or to butter or to yogurt or whatever, okay? There is a lot of options there, but uh, they, 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 they spent a lot of... Uh, I don't know how it is today, but 20 years ago there was a completely crazy amount of butter which were not sold, actually. So then, of course, the Europeans, they had to sell it elsewhere, maybe to the United States, China, Japan, or whatever. Again, at a lower price. But that's just how it is. Okay, it's... Um, it's, um, it's a consequence of what we would call an incompetitive local business, isn't it? That's what it means. It's possible to produce pig meat much cheaper in Denmark than in Norway. And the reasons are kind of obvious, because in Denmark, the climate is better. The geography makes pig farming much easier. You can have big pig farms. In Norway, you know, you have these mountains and you have these fjords and these valleys. So it's kind of limited uh, how you can do this efficiently. And if you want to produce vegetables or flowers or whatever. Everything is much better where it's flat, and it's easy to do, it's cheap to maintain the grounds and so on. In Norway it's extremely expensive. But Norway has made the decision that we take some of this oil money we pump up from under the sea and put it into our own country by paying the farmers to keep everything running. Okay, So that it, 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 it doesn't turn out to be like in Sweden where everything where it's just empty. 
Yeah, our Icelandic friends, uh, can I uh, attend your, uh, make your attention for a moment? Uh, we discussed Iceland. Uh, has anybody else been to Iceland here? Apart from me and these two guys? No. What do you think Iceland looks like? No, you are not allowed to answer, okay? Have you seen pictures from Iceland? Yeah. Are there any trees in Iceland? No, not, not in the wild, is it? There are no trees in Iceland. Uh, there is a lot of wind, kind of cold. When you walk on the ground, it starts to move yeah. all the time. If you live at a hotel, it kind of moves. Mm -hmm. There is continuous earthquakes on Iceland. There's volcano eruptions all the time. A very uh, special place, I must say. Uh, at least when I was there, I got really terrified. It was. Uh <laughs> So Iceland is a very special place, okay? It's very easy to produce elec electric energy in Iceland, very cheap. Yeah. It's just there, you just this hot water, just this way under the ground. So you can dig anywhere and produce the amount of electric energy you like, actually, as long as you have the technical technicalities. It's, it's, it's a good fishing area. You can get fish there. But that's among all. That's also almost what the only two things you can do cheaply. Maybe there is some minerals or something or oil. I don't know. You, have you any oil activity in Iceland? Uh, oil. Yeah. Uh, they are searching for it now. They are searching for it now. Yeah, they started late. The north <laughs> east in the east part. Yeah, not yeah. East. It's but on Iceland, there is not many people staying there, is it? Yeah. In Iceland, four hundred thousand or something. No, three hundred and fifty thousand. But Iceland is very big. You can drive for hours and days there from one side to the other. So it's almost no people anywhere. Only around uh, Reykjavik and some a few other places. How many is staying in Reykjavik? 150,000? Uh, the capital area is the Reykjavik and the towns around it is like 180. 180. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. around half of the population is kind of located around, around the, the capital. Of course, if you want to do pig farming in Iceland, that's possible. But it's kind of cold, so the pigs, they are not very happy. Yeah, so you have to have indoor uh, activities for them. <laughs> and, and they, uh, also, this last winter, we, we were, uh, the pig was, it was not enough because everybody was eating a lot of bacon. And so we had yeah. to like but buy something for No, I would like to launch an ID for you. We have some time here, okay? Let's look at the map, okay? Here is Iceland, it looks like this. So you have Norway down here, and here you have UK here, and here's the European mainland. It looks like this, and Sweden here, and Finland, and so on. Okay, you probably know that uh, there is some pipelines going down here. Uh, for instance, there is a pipeline from here down to UK, out here. Have you heard about that? It's a big one. Orman Lange is the field produces gas, which is kind of shipped through this pipeline down to. Easington in UK. And there are other pipelines from here down to the mainland, actually, down to Murdoch and Emden and so on. Okay, there is a lot of pipelines here, a lot of them. Okay. But now they are judging whether to build a new one up here, I think, to kind of connect here. Of course, the distance to Iceland seems kind of shorter and shorter now. Of course, the nice thing about these pipelines is that you can draw electric wires through them without almost no cost. Of course, if you can pr produce cheap infinite amount of electric energy here why don't you kind of connect here then and, and push the power down here instead that would be nice have you thought about this no, I haven't. <laughs> now this is a good idea isn't it <laughs> that will solve the at least the european energy problems wouldn't it there will be no co2 emissions everything will be produced directly from the ground in iceland okay Yeah, but this is this is kind of a much bigger problem. Okay, we are we are trying to solve the world climate problem here. Okay, <laughs> what is what what is the problem with this solution? Uh, maybe jobs, like a lot of people working in power plants in Europe. Oh yeah, that's the problem. But we can't. Uh, they will have to do something else. Okay. Like now we want to solve the big uh, climate problem here. That kind of runs all over the world. Okay. 
Can we do it by this solution here? No, of course not. We have the American continent where they emit a lot of CO2 and China is emitting a lot of CO2. So uh, unless we kind of fix those two agents, it doesn't help any much, I think. I think the United States and China <coughs> together more or less emit 70 or 80 percent of the whole world CO2 emissions. So it doesn't really help at all, does it? So the only solution seems to be that you have to to put one over to the USOA as well, okay? And then we can kind of take it down there, and then of course to China it's possible to kind of go. But uh, there you need a lot of electric uh, wires to make it work. But it's it's not impossible actually. But I think if you if you just start here by building this one, after this one has this one will be built in the next ten years, I think. It's, it's, I think it's kind of decided now. So then. Then it's relatively short to Iceland, and then of course you you can invest in all these uh, hydroelectric power plants. Or actually, it's not called hydroelectric. You have to use this um, temperature in the water to kind of convert it into electric current. That that's a kind of a straightforward process, not very expensive, and it will last as long as there is hot water on Iceland. But the hot water on Iceland comes from the inner of the Earth, doesn't it? So it will last as long as the inner of the Earth is hot. And by the time it's cold, we will all be dead. That's maybe millions of years ahead. So, so this is a good uh, power source, isn't it? But it's not. You can't. You don't have to do this only on Iceland. Don't you? There's a lot of other places. In Japan, for instance, there's a lot of volcanic activity and a lot of hot water springs. So I'm surprised that this hasn't been looked at. But okay. Okay, I think that's ends our talk today. So tomorrow, uh, Friday, we will take chapter 10, but then we will use a little bit more time, I think, and uh, look at uh, this exercise set 3. Okay, so have a look at, before we leave each other, uh, have a look at um, chapter 10. It's kind of a short chapter. We discuss Monopoly here, which we probably have discussed slightly already, uh, but also have a look at uh, this exercise set 3, this one.